Elizabeth Holmes has been found guilty on four counts of fraud, faces 20 years in prison for each guilty uh, count. They would be, I understand, served concurrently. Uh, most people I hear speculating four to 10 years. Um, and then I think you can get 15% off for good behavior. Again, I'm no expert on that, but that's what I read. Uh, guilty counts were two counts of wire fraud and two counts of conspiracy to commit fraud. She was originally charged with a total of 11 counts of fraud. Uh, four were guilty, four were not guilty, three were a split verdict. The jury said they were unable to come to a unanimous, unanimous verdict on three of the counts after more than 45 hours of deliberation. Quote from the Wall Street Journal article, juries were persuaded that Ms. Holmes conspired to defraud investors. This outcome could be significant because it means hundreds of millions of dollars of Theranos investors that there are those investors lost could be taken into consideration during her sentencing It's big numbers. The jury was split, however, on which of the six investors who testified were defrauded. The jurors convicted Ms. Holmes on three counts. These included $100 million from the family office of former edu education. We know Secretary the Betty. details, Jay Cal. Stop I labor. was like doing it for the audience. So anyway, um, thoughts on uh, the legal uh, technicalities of the case counselor sex well we've talked about this before i mean i think so at the end of the day she was convicted on the counts related to deceiving investors she was not on the counts related to patients i think that makes sense in that her obligations to investors are very clear whereas i think the the patient related duties are i mean she had them but it's a little bit less clear so i mean look it's it's what we've always said here as a founder you can be as messianic as you want to be. You can promise, you know, anything about your vision and what you intend into the future, but what you must do is be accurate about the current state of your business. You cannot lie about the deals that you've made, about the current capabilities of your product. And she was putting, you know, logos of customers she didn't have in her deck. She was lying about the military being a customer. So she simply exactly. misrepresented where she was at that time at the at when these investors invested. And that was the red line she should not have crossed. And I think in that sense, it's a pretty simple case. I think, you know, the, the, the part of this, again, you know, the, 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 the piece of this that's interesting is not the case itself, but really the media coverage, because the media wants to portray this case as an indictment of Silicon Valley and the thing you keep hearing over and over again. None of us were involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just factually, yes, exactly. We weren't involved. But what, what, what like, you, so, there's not a single person in Silicon Valley, I think, who put in a single shekel into this thing, who actually does this as a real job. Tim Draper. Well, she, he does no, a Tim investment. Draper put in a little bit of money as an angel. And then he, he didn't put a single dollar in after that. I'm saying, you know, you didn't come to Social Capital or to Craft Ventures or to Sequoia or to TPB or to Google. To raise money for this thing, none of that happened. You know, Sachs is right. Like the the summary of uh, the Wall Street Journal, Nick, you can post it because I, I put it in the group chat. Basically, summarized the fraud and is exactly what Sachs said. She affixed a logo of specifically, I think it was Pfizer, that had not validated Theranos's technology in materials she presented to investors. So she's basically like Pfizer said this is a go, and apparently that wasn't true. She gave the false impression that the devices were used by the U.S. military. That's what got all these military folks to sign on board and support it. That wasn't true. And then, uh, and then she, th the biggest coup was that she signed a deal with Walgreens and Safeway to include its devices in hundreds of stores. And then many investors saw these contracts as an endorsement of the technology and growth potential. But basically, those folks did no diligence and bought the hype. And so it was just a whole cycle of this thing that basically fell apart because the tests didn't work. Freeberg, what are your thoughts as our life science guru? What, what's most interesting to me is how does this get to this point? If you're Elizabeth Holmes, you're 19 years old, and you start telling your story, and the more grandiose the story you tell is, the better the reaction you get is, it becomes reinforcing. And the behavior extends a little bit further and a little bit further. Every time she told a story about how incredible this tech was, it's just one drop. You take one drop, it can measure everything. When she simplified it and reduced it to that, and it was such an incredible statement, and she saw the reaction from people, she's like, wow, that works. Let me repeat it. It's like any good salesperson. They figure out what sells, and then they sell it, and then they repeat. And what's interesting to me that, you know, you talk about the media, but... <coughs> When she went out and told her story and got incredible press coverage because 
She was a young female doing something that was going to save lives. There was this altruistic Steve Jobs-esque kind of combination here. The media wrote a, a glowing review of her. And then she said, wow, look, they said something great. Let me go do that again. And she got a bigger media piece written and a bigger media piece. And the more she said, the bigger she said it, the more she claimed she could do, the bigger the story got, the more coverage she got. And the whole thing became this kind of reinforcing cycle. And I do think that the press coverage that she got as she was building this business, which helped her raise capital, helped her attract employees, helped her get Walgreens and Safeway to the table, allowed was her, her downfall. To it, it allowed her to build the business, but it's exactly what created the narrative that wasn't true. And so the coverage that the press gave her, and we see this every day, you guys all see these top 50 companies. And we all know, having met a lot of these companies, as you go down that list, this, this 20 companies are total scam companies, they're fraud, they're not going to work, they're grifters, all the stuff that you guys might say about the quality of those businesses. But the press reporter isn't doing diligence. They're not a no. You know, it turns out all the diligence was done after the fact. And then it's like, well, maybe we should go do some diligence. Oh, wait a second. Because the, the press coverage has now created this hype story about who and what she is, the, the diligence actually pays off because you have something to take apart. If she was just a nobody startup that raised $30 million and they're still trying to figure out their way, there would be no value in any reporter doing diligence on her and trying to figure out what was actually there. It was because the story got big that it gave everyone, including John Kerry, an incentive. He's the Wall Street Journal reporter who broke all this, an incentive to go in and take this thing apart. Totally. And so Let I think it's, it's really unfortunate break. and it's really self-reinforcing that the press yeah. coverage that created the circumstance here ultimately also enabled them, the press, to take the thing apart and you know land, land this woman in jail. And I'm not saying she did nothing wrong, but I'm just saying that there's a system here. And the system is set up in yeah, such a way that... Yeah, but she manipulated the press. Yeah, she, she yeah. manipulated the press. Let me ask, let me ask press. one question to you, Freeberg, and then I'll, I got a question for Saxon, Shamath. Her basic premise that one drop of blood could get you hundreds of results. Let me just ask you a question, Freeberg. At what point would one drop of blood or so, a nanotube, uh, be able to, at our current technological um, you know, ramp, be able to give us a hundred different data points on a person. Every time you're generating a data point, you're running what's called an assay, which is a, a measurement of something. The question is, how much of a molecule are you measuring against what volume? Is there enough of that molecule in that volume to give you a statistically good reading? And that is a function of how precisely you can measure that thing. So there are, there are great advances happening right now in, an, in a domain in life sciences of, uh, of hardware technology called microfluidics. This is the manipulation of picoliter, you know, very, very small volumes of liquid, and then being able to run chemical assays using biochemical techniques, which we now have all these amazing new kind of tools like CRISPR and other things that would allow us to get a much more precise measurement with a much smaller volume than has ever been possible. So we can manipulate small fluids, we can measure them. So there's nothing today that would physically say we cannot do many of the things that she claimed to have been able to do. But there are, there's a stacking of technology assets that need to be done to make that happen in reality. Take and, a guess. And each of those assets are very different. So look, you could do it with cholesterol right now. You could do it with blood sugar right now. But you couldn't do both. You could, theoretically. You could put them into a device and do that. No, the reason, the reason why lipids work... Can you do 400 things? No, with, you cannot. You know, Right. You cannot. I've I've actually funded three of these businesses, and I've poured almost a hundred million dollars of money into it, and they've all failed. And the reason is exactly what he said: you can do cholesterol because lipids are big enough, you know, and so you can basically build an assay that can pick that off with a drop of blood. You can do a reasonably good job with pretty large error bars on sugar, but all of this other stuff where you're going to replace like a you know a CBC or these broad you know profile panels that we all get once a year to assess our health. Today, I don't think that that's necessarily within reach. It's not within technological reach. And it's not because people aren't, you know, smart enough. It's just that not enough of this investment is happening because then you go back to this whole idea where the funding cycle needs to see a big payoff for the capitalists to want to get involved in this thing. And there really isn't. You know, it's not as if like Quest and LabCorp are printing $400 billion of revenue and profits. And so it's not like there's a massive economic incentive to run in. And so even when, you know, we have tried on multiple occasions with completely different teams of incredible people, every single time we have failed. So there's a physics uh, <laughs> law here that's just not physically possible. 
she made this claim, uh, Sachs. Remember, in two- and don't don't make it broad. There are things, there are molecules, there are pathogens, there are things you can absolutely detect. Small molecules, and small molecules. You can yeah. you can detect with a drop of blood. You know, measure counting how many blood cells you have in your whole body. You know, using a, an estimate from a single droplet of blood, because you know we have these machines called flow cytometry machines where we sort blood cells. And then it, it'll tell you how many red blood cells you have and how many different kinds of white blood cells. That's a big part of your annual checkup that you'll typically get. You know, you need a good amount of blood to get an accurate reading on how many blood cells there are using even just using lasers and, and you know, these sophisticated machines. Can you reduce that down to a droplet? Physically, probably not, right? And so there's some, it's not universal to say this is possible, it's not possible. There are elements that are absolutely possible, some of which are being done today. And there are some things that are going to be very hard to pull off. Got it. And she was making these claims as early as 2003 when it was founded. So we're talking about 19 years ago, and we're saying here it's not going to be possible to do hundreds of these things, maybe in our lifetime. We're talking about decades from there. We need to be some significant breakthrough. Sachs, let me ask you a legal question. I was on a podcast and I said to them, I, why haven't the prosecutors had Bill Maris, who uh, is a friend of Freeberg's, who helped me get him on the podcast? He was great. Thank you for that, uh, David, on this week in startups. Very smart guy. Very smart guy. And he came out publicly when he was running Google Ventures. And he said, we looked at it a couple of times. He's referring to Theranos. But there was so much hand waving, like, look over here, that we couldn't figure it out. So we just had someone from our life science investment team go into Walgreens and take the test. And it wasn't that difficult for anyone to determine that things may not have been, not be what they seem here. Now, Sachs, I was on this podcast, The Dropout, which I think is an ABC News one. And I said, why didn't the prosecution bring up, you know, GV, let's assume Sequoia and Dreesen and, you know, the 20 top firms in the Valley, uh, who said no, and they all said no, because she wouldn't show them due diligence. And I asked them, why didn't the prosecutors bring up those 20 firms and compel them to testify about why they didn't invest to give the counter example? And she said, I don't know. Wouldn't that have been a much better strategy to say, t- here are the credible people who didn't invest? I'm not sure I see the relevance of that because Elizabeth Holmes' crime was not promising something that she couldn't ultimately deliver on. It's okay to fail in Silicon Valley. One of the best things about Silicon Valley is that we don't punish failure. Her mistake was in making misrepresentations to the people who did invest. Right. If well, anything, what I'm saying is, if Sachs, anything, is that- actually, what, what Elizabeth Holmes maybe should have done was call up some of those firms, and they could have said how easy it was for them to figure out th- that they shouldn't have invested. Maybe that would have been a way to kind of muddy the waters on her side. Well, I, say, I was thinking that they would have said, hey, she wouldn't show us the technology, and when we did our independent diligence, she wouldn't let us diligence. We did outside backdoor diligence. It failed. There were red flags all over this thing. We, we had talked about it in our poker games way before this thing went off the rails. Um, the fact that there were no major VC firms involved who, could, who had expertise in biotech, who could do the diligence. It was all sort of, it was basically uh, family office money of people who weren't in Silicon Valley, you know, writing big checks, whether it was Rupert Murdoch or the DeVos family or what have you. It, there were there were just red flags coming off this thing, which is why Silicon Valley was not, by and large, duped by it. The people who were duped by it were the people that Elizabeth Holmes was able to sell the patina of Silicon Valley to, and the media, because the media, well, well, what we've seen over and over again is they don't fact check stories when they fit their priors. The prior here is that you know what the media want to believe is that the next Steve Jobs was going to be a woman. And so when Elizabeth Holmes served that up to them wearing the black turtleneck, it was too good a story for them to fact check too heavily. And so they ran with it. It fit the narrative. In the same way, in the same way that, you know, the ivermectin hoax that Rolling Stone ran with was too good a story to be fact checked because they want to believe that the MAGA people in Oklahoma were eating horse paste. I mean. No, there's a there's hundred better examples of just, I mean, just to be generic sacks of other startups that we all know are total nonsense. And the, total, total nonsense. And the there's reporters a, there's write a, up about them. There's a he, there's a fraud in biotech going on right now that hey. you know, David mm-hmm. and I David and I saw up front. I mean, it's like this stuff is crazy. 